Please turn with me, if you will, in your scriptures to Acts chapter number 17 as we continue our look at the book of Acts. Acts chapter number 17, if you will. Um, each week we start off by letting the audience know we have new people at times and we always have new people listening uh, on the internet and pretty soon these will be on the YouTube channel. We have a YouTube channel that's bringing forth fruit as well. Some saints uh, out in Colorado are putting that together for us. And uh, so I want to remind you and, and, and them what the purpose of the book of Acts. God had the book of Acts put in the Bible where it's at to show how, did, how God went from dealing with the nation of Israel, Genesis through Malachi, and then accordingly in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when Messiah, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, showed up to Israel, how did he go from dealing with the lost sheep of the house of Israel to when you come to Paul's epistles, Romans through Philemon, the first book is Romans, how did he end up dealing with the Gentiles? Well, the book of Acts explains it's that bridge between God's program exclusively with the nation of Israel and then the Gentiles through them to now dealing with Gentiles through the fall of Israel and not the rise of Israel. The actions and the activities of the apostles is showing how God has a transition period from his dealings with one nation, Israel. He sets them aside in unbelief when they commit the unpardonable sin, Acts 7, led by Saul of Tarsus, who became the apostle Paul, how the 12 apostles to Israel under the power of the Holy Ghost speak to Israel about their kingdom program. But through Israel's fall and their rejection of Messiah and his kingdom, God saves the one unique, distinct apostle Paul, Acts 9. And from there, you see the diminishing of Israel, the casting away of Israel, and then Paul's ministry of, to the Gentiles increasing. And what Acts shows is the activities of the apostles as you see the fall of Israel, the diminishing of Israel, and salvation going to the Gentiles. That's the purpose of Acts. We're in mid-Acts right now, and here we see the Apostle Paul's ministry start to grow, as it were. Acts chapter 17, uh, look with me at, at verse number 1. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. Now, last week we read the entire chapter. We got into verse 1. We saw what these uh, cities were about, uh, Amp Amphipolis, Apollonia, Thessalonica. These were types of the Gentile nations that were on the verge of eternal damnation until God sends the Apostle Paul. Here in verse 1, there is a synagogue of the Jews there in Thessalonica. Remember, in Philippi, because that was a Roman colony, there was no synagogue of the Jews that I can see. So those Jews met for prayer at a riverside. That's where Paul met Lydia and those others. They, did, they then had a church that began with Lydia. The Philippian jailer in his house, uh, and, and you start to see the, the church at Philippi, where we know the, Philippian, um, the, book of, of, the book of Philippians is now based on that church. But now we go to the Thessalonians. Here in Thessalonica, there is a synagogue of the Jew because it wasn't a Roman colony, as it were. What was a Roman colony? Philippi was a Roman colony, type of a capital in that area where Roman citizens live. Not just Roman citizens. Paul was a Roman citizen, but real Romans, Italians. They, they migrated from Italy over to Philippi, and they didn't allow those Jews to have a synagogue. But Thessalonica, they did. Um, by the way, in verse 2, look at verse 2, 1 Corinthians, uh, excuse me, 1 Corinthians, uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 2. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them. Paul the apostle, even though he is the apostle of and to the Gentiles, the apostle of the body of Christ, the grace message, the grace dispensation. Early in his ministry, he did have a provoking ministry to the people of Israel. Hold your hand here, because people are going to ask you, say, well, is Paul the apostle of the Gentiles? Why did he speak to Jews? Well, you, let's look at it. Go back, go back to Romans chapter 11, if you will. It's just a refresher for some, but this is, might be a, uh, a new thing for others. Romans chapter 11, if you will. Look with me at verse number 13. Here's a famous verse on Paul's apostleship, but I want you to understand what he's saying and why he's saying it. Romans 11, verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles, as Paul explains Israel's past in Romans 9, how they, they were the people of God, but through unbelief they fell. Um, he, in Romans 10, he explains Israel's present condition in grace. 
All there was was a believing remnant, a kingdom remnant in Paul's day. The rest of Israel was blinded. Those kingdom believers, when Paul got saved, they'll inherit the kingdom. They were eternally secure. At that point, up until Paul, there was no man eternally secure. You had to continue on. But with the salvation of Saul by grace through faith plus nothing, God sealed those believing remnant Jews who were there at that moment. And there was a remnant according to the election of grace, Paul calls it. Well, Romans 10, Israel set aside. But Romans 11, God, Paul, God through Paul says, Israel, I'm not done with Israel. Romans 11, 25. There's a blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. When God finishes the church, the body of Christ for the heavenly places and take us home through the rapture, God will begin his prophetic program to fulfill his promise to Abraham and his seed. Well, here Paul says, verse 13, for I speak to you Gentiles. He's God's spokesman. Inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, apostoli, a sent one, Acts 9, 15. He's my chosen vessel, the Lord says. But look what he says. I magnify myself. No, I magnify my office. By the way, that, that word magnify, the Greek word, it doesn't matter, but the Greek word behind it means it's the same for glorified in Romans 8, 30. To magnify means to glorify his apostleship. And we're going to see how important that is when we look at 1 Corinthians in the next session. Because Paul is going to mention the Lord Jesus, he's going to mention Apollos himself and Peter, Cephas, and he's going to say, we don't follow any man after the flesh. I am not meet to be called an apostle, but my apostleship you're going to follow, okay? Follow my apostleship. Verse 14, here's why he magnifies his office. If by any means I, might prov I may provoke to emulation, that means copycat, them which are my flesh, those are the Jewish people, and might save some of them. So Paul, as his manner was, he would go into these synagogues because the Bible was there as they knew it, the Old Testament. He would try to convince Jewish people that that Jesus of Nazareth, that their people were saying he's just an accursed carpenter on that cross, that Roman cross, was really God the Son. Now look what he says, is, as his manner was. I want you to understand that his normal life, and, and, and this speaks to us too, your normal life should be assembling with saints. Paul wasn't just out there doing his thing. Even as an apostle, he would regularly come and fellowship where the word of God was. You need to be where the word of God is being taught. Hold your hand here. Look with me, if you will, at John chapter 18. Go back to the book of John, John chapter 18. Um, it's a blessing from God to have an assembly you can attend. We go over the country. I thank God for Brother Joshua because he can fill in. He, he's growing his ministry here at Twin Cities Grace Fellowship and doing other things as well. As I go out to conferences and look at saints who say, Brother Ron, this is all we have. We set our schedule around these conferences in, 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 the, in the United States because we don't have a grace church where we're at. We're blessed to have an assembly where we can fellowship together. It's a blessing. And it ought to be your manner, your normal, regular life of fellowshipping. Because watch what happens here. John chapter 18, look at verse 20. In that Jewish culture, verse, verse 20, John 18, verse 20, Jesus answered him, I spake openly in the, to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort, and, and in secret have I said nothing. When they came to get the Lord, he says, look here, my normal everyday life was going into the synagogues on the Sabbath day and going to the temple. And I spoke openly and taught the word of God, where the, the Jews always resort. And that was their way of life. And Christ went where the, the people of God were to hear the word of God. Go over with me, if you will, to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 14. I, brought, I wanted you to see the Lord Jesus Christ. That was his life. And it ought to be our life. Matthew, Mark, Luke. It ought to be our lifestyle of fellowshipping around the word of God. Luke chapter 4, look at verse 16. Luke chapter 4 and verse 16. Excuse me, Luke 4, 16. Speaking of the Lord Jesus, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. So he's going back to his hometown, Nazareth. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. What we are looking at is the Lord's first public preaching session recorded in scripture 
when he's about to, he found the place in Isaiah that spoke of him, the, the, the part uh, about uh, the spirit of the Lord, Isaiah 61, his anointing him as Messiah to, to preach the kingdom to the, to the people of Israel. What I want you to see is that that was his custom from a youth. You know, Chris and I, now that we have a child, and we see uh, Susie and, and, and her family there, they have a little child, uh, the little grandson. You want to get your children used to growing up where the word of God rightly divided is taught. Well, that ought to be your, your custom as an adult. It was the Lord's. It was our Apostle Paul's. Go back to Acts chapter number 17. God put this in the scriptures as an example because that's where the word of God, that's where the fellowship. Acts 17, look at verse 2. And Paul, as his manner was. You know, your parents says, mind your manners. This is your actions. Watch how you act, your behavior. Well, Paul's actions, his behavior was to always go where the word of God and where people who were interested in the word of God was. And we ought to do the same. He went in unto those Jews and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. So it was basically over two weeks. He, had to, he, he went in on that, on that Sabbath day. He went in another Sabbath day. There's one week and then another one. So over the course of that time, that wasn't how, how long he was in Thessalonica, but that's how long he, he, he dealt with these particular Jews in this synagogue. What's going to happen is they're going to just start to reject him. Some will believe, but the majority, after they heard him, a, a Jew needs two or three witnesses. So he gives them a witness, a witness, and a witness, and finally they have some information to make some determinations. Today our topic is putting God on trial, and I'm going to show you that our job as preachers, Joshua, mine, whoever preaches, even you as you share God's gospel, is to put people, to make them reason with the word of God. You, you know, Mike and I talk about lost people, and, and we need to get them not just lost, we need to show them they're dead. And you take God's word and put them on trial, but then you reason with them and tell them, hey, look at God's word. Let's look at it together. Let's put God on trial. I'm going to show you that God is okay. That's the importance of right division. Most saints, don't want to rightly, uh, most saints don't rightly divide, and so they want to pretend like verses aren't really saying what they say and don't contradict. Hey, when you rightly divide, let's look at the contradictions and see what's going on. God is not afraid for you to put him under a microscope and see what's up. Watch this. The word of God is a reasonable thing because there's plenty of evidence in it, and Paul takes it like a prosecuting attorney and presents the facts. Look what it says here in verse 3. When he went in there, he opened, so he opened the scriptures, and he alleged, that word alleged is used in courtrooms. Somebody commits a, 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 a crime, you said he, he allegedly committed that crime, and it's up to the prosecutor to present the case beyond a reasonable doubt that that guy is guilty. And, and then the defense attorney takes that same stuff and try to present that he's reasonable doubt that he's not. Well, what Paul was opening and alleging, look at verse 3 that Christ must needs have suffered. Now, watch how Paul dealt with Jews. He went into their Old Testament, had nothing to do with Jesus of Nazareth yet, okay? He goes and he takes passages like Isaiah 53. He takes passages like Isaiah 9, unto us a, son, a child is born, a son is given. Isaiah 53, his death, burial, resurrection. We know that from Acts 8, the Ethiopian eunuch. Daniel chapter 9, and he shows all these passages where Messiah must be cut off, where Messiah must make his soul, God makes his soul an offering for sin. And Paul starts to build a case through scripture that the first thing, not even that Jesus is the Christ, but that Messiah has to die. Now think about that. He, he, he doesn't even bring up Jesus. He just says, okay, Jews, let's look at it. Is it clear that the scriptures say that Messiah must suffer? And they go, yeah. See, the Jews had a twofold thing about Messiah. If you read their, their works even today, old time Jews in, in antiquity, if you go on Jewish websites, they think Messiah, they, they, they don't understand one Messiah had to suffer and then have glory. They see a suffering Messiah and then a glorious Messiah. What they wanted was the glorious Messiah. Messiah, the son of God, had to do both. He had to be the suffering and then the glory. Look what he says. He alleged that Christ must needs have suffered. So Paul says, okay, Jews, we're not going to even talk about Jesus, but just, just, just reason with me is, are not the scriptures saying that whoever Messiah is, he has to suffer? And they say, yay, Paul, we see that. Okay, Paul would show some other verses about Messiah must rise from the dead. He says, yep, yep, I can see it. Isaiah 53, hold your hand here, go over to Isaiah 53. I, I, I am persuaded in my mind as I study this out that Paul used this passage. 
Get Isaiah 53 and Daniel chapter 9. I just want you to see something. Isaiah 53 and Daniel 9. Oh, man, there's a bunch of Psalms, too, but we won't get them. Isaiah 53 and Daniel 9. Just look at a couple of passages. I could see Paul saying, here's Messiah. Isaiah 53. And look at verse number 1. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. That's that, he's that root of Jesse there. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. You know, Judas had to kiss the Lord Jesus Christ to show those soldiers who were coming to get him because he looked like a normal, regular Jew. He wasn't like Saul, tall and handsome. He's not going to be like the Antichrist is, tall, handsome, type of Saul was the type of that. He, he looked like your average Jew. Judas had to kiss him so that they would know him because there was nothing special about him. There was no beauty that we should desire him. Verse 3, he is despised and rejected of men. Those are the men of Israel. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Interesting, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 18, that says, with much wisdom comes much sorrow. In which much understanding comes much grief. What, the reason he, was, he had sorrows and, and, and acquainted with grief, not so much his sufferings, but because he was way wise. He, way wise. That was my Ebonics. He was much wiser than everyone. <laughs> you know that as grace believers. When we look at our world today, the vanity of the decisions of our leaders, our government leaders, you go, that's stupid. That's vanity. And it, and, 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 it, and it gives your heart sorrow and grief to see our country going the way it is because they're not using godly wisdom. Well, that was the Lord. It says in Hebrews, we're going to see on Thursdays that he walked around, everybody sinned around him, and he was pure and sinless, but yet he didn't just condemn everybody. That's interesting to me. He suffered suffered sinners. Imagine if the Lord looked at you and me, and he was so pure, everything we did almost was a sin. He could read our thoughts. He could watch our actions. We we might snap at somebody when we shouldn't. We might be impatient. He, he could just point out stuff all the time, but he, he didn't. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. But he also had the grief of the rejection of the people of Israel. Verse 3, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. I love that. The Lord told Nicodemus in John 3, he says, men love darkness rather than light. He was pure light and pure. Men would avoid him. People avoid the word of God. This church should be filled up. You know why it's not? Most of the time, it's because people just... It's the the word of God is so powerful and it walks down our streets is what it does. And the reason church people just play church and go to denominations and stuff, they don't really want the pure word of God. This is the Bible student. Well, the Lord was like that. Oh, he was the walking word of God. And only those who really wanted him. John 666 says when he started talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, his disciples, they left him and walked not anymore. He only he looked at the 12. He says, are you? Everybody left them except the 12. He says, are you guys going to leave me too? Peter says, speaking for them, Where are we, to whom will we go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. And that's what it's all about. Do you want the words of eternal life or not? Well, that was the Lord. He, he, he was, he was uh, they hid their faces, verse 3. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs. Look at the prophecy. He bore the griefs of the nation of Israel and carried our sorrows. And yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. They said, if thou be the son of God, come down off that cross. But they didn't understand that he was up there for their sins if they trusted him. Verse 5, but he was wounded for our child. Listen, Paul is reading this to these Jews. They're looking at Jesus of Nazareth and how just a, 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 a few years earlier he was on that Roman cross. And according to their own legend that his disciples stole his body and hid him somewhere, ridiculous. How are they going to get past these Roman guards? These guys went fishing. They didn't even know about the resurrection in their own understanding. Hey, Paul is saying all that stuff, Isaiah already wrote it. Look here. He was stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. Paul says he was wounded for our transgressions. By the way, he's not even talking Christ. Jesus yet. He's just saying Messiah has to be wounded. I mean, I love it. He's just getting them. So Messiah has to be wounded for our transgressions. He has to be bruised, verse 5, for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are, he- we are healed. All we like sheep are, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord laid unto him the iniquity of us all. They go, whoever Messiah is, this has to happen. 
He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. You know what judgment is? Judgment is he was sitting there at, at, at Pilate's judgment seat. And Pilate washed his hands and says, I will not do anything to this just man, but because of political, because of politics, he closed his eyes to justice and didn't give him the proper judgment of innocent. He said it, but he didn't stamp it as the, as the Roman governor there. But look what he says here in verse 8. And who shall declare his generation? All his apostles, all his men, all his his people just left him, left him alone. You know, I think about the Apostle Paul. He says in the last days of grace, that's what's going to happen. There's going to be this tiny bit of even grace believers. He says all day at the end of his life, which is a type of the end of the dispensation of grace, all they that be in Asia have turned away from me. Well, they did it to the Lord, too, at the end of his life. Look what he says here. He says he was, verse 8, for he was cut off out of the land of the living. Now, that's fantastic. To those Jews who listen to Paul preach this message about being cut off, cut off, you'd be cut off from your people, cut off from your people, be just like a Gentile, you lost. That's what he was. He's talking about eternal death, uh, an eternal, uh, the second death, cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. So Paul is like, okay, Messiah has to go through all of this. Oh, keep reading, verse 9. He made his grave with the wicked. There was those two thieves on the cross. You know, I was thinking about that as I was preparing this, and I said, you know who those two thieves? I wish I could get up, boy, and draw it. It's the Lord here, and you got two thieves. Both of them are the type of the nation of Israel, both of them. Here's God in the middle. You got apostate Israel. No, no they, they both are sinners. Both of them are railing on them. One of them changes mind. One of them says, ah, if you be the son of God, come down, help us do that thing. Type of apostate Israel. The other ones start to think about and listen and watch and go, I need to repent. He is Messiah. Lord, remember me when thou come. That's a type of the little flock. And so you got those two. They both these worthy of death. All of Israel's worthy of death. This one trusted the Messiah to die, and they went down to paradise together. That one, the apostate, went to hell, the, the torment side. That other guy was a type of the believing remnant who came to understand that he was Messiah. See, that, that thief on the cross that went to paradise, type of the believing remnant. The two people in Israel, lost, the uh, apostate, and then the believers. Well, that's, that's what, when it says he made his grave with the wicked, verse 9, that was it. And with the rich in his death, Joseph of Arimathea, you can see that in the Gospels. He was in a rich man's tomb. Now, Paul is telling him, all this has to be about Messiah. Verse 9, because he had done no violence, Neither was any deceit in his mouth, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. They kept saying, if thou be the son of God, come down off that cross. If thou be the son of God, let's watch and see if God or Elijah will deliver him. You know, watch this. It pleased the Lord, verse 10, to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. By the way, he shall see his seed. When he died, he went to paradise. I have no doubt that the Lord went to paradise to show all those Jewish believers who believed on him. When I say believed on him, believed his word to them. They didn't know about him. He walked up in paradise, saw Abraham and all, and says, I'm here. I'm Messiah. I, I can see it. He saw his seed. He shall prolong his days. There's his resurrection. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. There's his kingdom. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. Propitiation, Romans 3. By his knowledge, that's the knowledge of Messiah, shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, he sh and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. That's the second death, not just your, the, the death of the, uh, of the physical. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, that's Israel, and made intercessor for the transgressors. What I want you to see is Paul is preaching, this is what Messiah has to go through. And now, go over to Daniel chapter 9 on the way back to Acts. Because Paul is going to now say, it was Jesus of Nazareth. Daniel chapter 9. I emailed a Jewish, a Jewish rabbi about six months ago. 
I just happened to stumble across his little website. And uh, he was just taking pot shots at, at, at uh, us Gentile Christians. And I just politely, knowing how the Apostle Paul did it, asked him about some of these passages. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, you Christians always bring up Isaiah 53. I said, what about it, though? Oh, well, you know. And I go, what about Daniel 9? Didn't God give Daniel a time schedule? Daniel chapter 9, look at verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the whole, thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy and anoint the most holy. Therefore, now Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build uh, Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. Now, after explaining all this to him, he didn't want to email me back because he can't do anything with it. He understands, see, Jews understand these weeks or weeks of years. They understand from the book of Jeremiah. They understand all this. They just don't believe it. And I said, that says Messiah the Prince. He should have showed up 2,000 years ago. Where was he? I didn't hear back from him then. That says Messiah, that's the Lord Jesus, well, we know it's the Lord, but that's Messiah. Paul would say Messiah had to show up in our day. And three score and two weeks, verse, verse 25, the streets shall be built again and the wall, even in troublous times, that's Nehemiah and Ezra and all that. And after three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off. The same cut off, he has to die. Must, Christ must needs have suffered, Paul says. It not, he's not even teaching that Jesus is Messiah. He's just, t- he just teaching Messiah has to be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy. That's all future. That's the Antichrist. What I want you to see is this prophecy is about Messiah's coming, being cut off, raised from the dead, and then bringing the kingdom later. Paul preached this stuff. Go, go back with me, if you will, to the book of Acts, Acts 17. So don't let people blow smoke at you. The kingdom should have been here a long time ago. The dispensation of grace... Is, is the reason this guy out there attacking dispensationalism, real famous guy in the Twin Cities, he, he lost his mind. I sit down with him and tell him, Where, put, put your verses on a timeline. See, you can, you can claim all of this, but put them on a timeline and let's see where's the kingdom. Where's the kingdom? What, the only answer for the kingdom not being here is the dispensation of grace. That's it. What God has been doing nearly 2,000 years, that's the only thing that you can answer where's the question and keep God's integrity intact. Verse 3, Acts 17, he opened, he alleged that Christ must needs have suffered. So he didn't even preach Christ, Jesus yet. He just said Christ has to suffer and risen again from the dead. Now, after doing that, Paul says there's only one man who fulfilled all those prophecies of our fathers in the scriptures and that this Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, whom I preach unto you is Christ. Paul, then he lays it out. He says, everything that was written happened to this Jesus of Nazareth. Ah, see that? He got him. Look at the next, next part of that. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. You know what? We're going to look at verse 4 next time, but I want you to see this issue of being reasonable. You know, atheists accuse Christians of being Crazy, unreasonable fools. But actually, the Bible makes it clear that the atheist is the fool. We're going to see that. There's nothing more reasonable on planet Earth than believing that the Bible is God's word. And with the rest, we got 20 minutes, and I'm going to show you that. The word of God is the most reasonable piece of literature on planet Earth because it's the way that you know that God exists. I've read the Quran, no prophecies. I've read, you can, whatever else you want to read, I did that for the black Muslims in Chicago when I dealt with them out there on uh, uh, Nation of Islam, Louis Farrakhan boys. This book is proof that God exists. Here's how you know that. Watch this. The Bible is going to make it clear through scientific facts that God exists. Because you have to explain to me as an atheist how all these Jewish men, beginning with Job, the oldest piece of literature in antiquity, and all these Jews... One little group of people in the world know more stuff about science than any Gentile heathen ever. There's stuff in the book of Job, if I had a scientific mind, like some of you all, like Brother Chell and some of these guys who could think through these things, I could see things in the book of Job, I, I just not, I'm just not confident because I don't have that scientific mind, I don't care, that mankind has not yet 
discovered, but Job wrote about it. If, if, I, if I could do that, I would do it. I wish I had a financial mind, too, because you can do that with, with finances, too. I put it like this, gold is big in the Bible. That's all I want to say. Back in Genesis, God says gold is good. In Revelation, gold is good. So you got gold, just good. So that's just a little something from the Bible for you. So, <laughs> By the way, look what he says here. He says he opened an alleged, he reasoned with them. Now let's put God on trial. Hold your hand here and go with me, if you will, to 1 Samuel chapter 12. All through Israel's history, we'll look at this for the next 15 minutes. All through Israel's history, God says... Test me, try me, prove me. It's reasonable. I'm reasonable. Where do you think you got your mind from? I'm a creative genius. God is the first and only intellect, the only wise God. Watch this. 1 Samuel chapter 12, look at verse 7. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 7. Start at verse 6 to get the context. And Samuel said unto the people, Samuel was a prophet to the nation of Israel. It is the Lord that advanced Moses and Aaron and that brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. Hey, the fact that they were standing in the land of Canaan was the fact that God's word was true. Moses, as they coming out of Egypt there at the Red Sea, here comes Pharaoh and his army. They all worried, oh, Lord, what are you going to do? Moses said, Shh, stand still and see the salvation of our Lord. They saw it with signs and wonders. They didn't really have the reason. They could see these things. And it's a little different today. We're going to walk by faith and not by sight, Paul says, but we got enough proof in this book. We sang that song, The Bible Stands. I picked that song because it's a verse in there that says, The Bible stands like a rock undaunted through the raging storms of times. Its truths by none never well refuted and destroy it, they never can. Man has been trying to destroy this book and they can't. Why? Because it's God's book. I'm going to show you that. Look at chapter 12 of 1 Samuel. Verse 7, now therefore stand still that I may do what? Reason with you before the Lord of all the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did to you and to your fathers. Samuel says, shh, stop being murmuring unbelief. Let's just look at what God did in our history. One of the greatest proofs of God's truthfulness is the fact that there's a people on earth called the Jew. You know that? Not even the nation over there. That man put that together. Now, it, it's being set for the end times. That nation over there, they did that by uh, flesh, by the flesh. It, it's not their land. Uh, it's their land, but God is not dealing with people as a nation today when you rightly divide. We're living in a dispensation of grace. So the stage is being set. But just the fact there are Israelites and Jewish people in the world is proof they were a miraculous people. God gave Abraham and Sarah supernatural ability while their bodies were dead and they were old, 190, to have a child. Abraham, he had so much power from God, even after Sarah died, he had more children by Keturah. God gave him life in his body, seed. And then Isaac came, and then there was Isaac, and then he come Jacob. And through there, the people of Israel are a God-originated people. But besides that, forget that, that's the, it's the book. Look what he says here, verse 7. Now therefore stand still that I may reason with you before the Lord. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 1. Go to Isaiah chapter 1. Don't run from some intellect. Can I tell you that? Who are they? Paul says, who art thou, O vain man, to reply us against God? You take the sword of the spirit. Come on, saints. Don't be afraid. It's God's sword of the spirit. It's a sword. It's invisible, but it's real. And just like if I stood before you and you had a sword, today it's a gun, you know. I mean, they, that's how they use, now we have guns. It's like somebody putting a gun in your head and says, oh, I don't believe that's going to, you shoot them and they're dead, right? Well, they, you don't believe, somebody don't believe that this is, the, is God's word. Who cares what they believe? God believes is his word. And you take that sword, and just like a real sword that somebody didn't believe, it, but you stuck them, they're going to hurt and bleed. You take this Bible and you hit them, man, you get them. God says it. Look at Isaiah chapter 1 and verse number 18. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Come now, God pleads with the nation of Israel, and let us do what? Reason together, saith the Lord. God is not afraid to reason with you. Go with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 24. That's what Paul did, Acts chapter 24. The apostle Paul, he showed us how we can deal with people. You take God's word and you reason with them. 
And if they claim not to believe this is God's word, you tell them, show me why it's not. Put it on them. How did Job know that the earth hung upon nothing? How did Job know that there were springs under the sea and mountains under the sea? Nobody could get down there. All these, if you need help, I'll send you a list. There's a whole website where there's men who all they do is think, believers who go in there, scientific guys who find all these scientific facts that us heathen Gentiles discovered in the 1800s. And he says that was already back there 3,000 years ago in Job. You atheists tell me, how did they know that? At the very least, you got to say, those Jews knew a lot of stuff that we didn't know. Well, the question is, how did they know that? How do you know something where man can't get down there or up there? There has to be some type of extraterrestrial intellect telling them that, and that's God. There's enough proof. I'm going to show you. Look with me, if you will, at Acts 24, verse 5, 25. Acts 24, 25. This is Paul. And as he, Paul, reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix did what? Trembled. Can I tell you? The Apostle Paul never tried to prove to somebody that of God's existence. Paul took the word of God and says, Revelation 21, verse 8. He didn't do that, but that wasn't, it wasn't written yet, but I do that. What that verse say? But brother, I don't believe that. What that verse say? All liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is second death. So if you did believe that, what is that saying? Well, oh yeah, second death. Anybody who's ever told a lie will end up in the lake of fire. And then I leave them and say, let's go fishing, you know. Give it to them. Paul, what this guy did, he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, that means a, a, a temperate lifestyle of moderance, and judgment to come. And I'm going to show you what that judgment. And when Paul preached the word of God to this guy, he trembled. He literally shook in his boots because he, he, Paul made it clear that that guy was on his way to hell. Look at Acts chapter 28, verse 23. Acts chapter 28, verse 23. Acts 28, verse 23. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging. This is Paul. To whom he expounded and testified the, gospel, the kingdom of God persuading them concerning Jesus both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning until evening. What Paul did is to take God's word at that time. He, and when it says the kingdom of God, not the gospel of the kingdom, Acts 20, 24 says the gospel of the grace of God. The kingdom of God is heaven and earth. But he explained and persuaded them through, through the scriptures that concerning Jesus. All that Old Testament spoke about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, look with me the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1, look at verse 18. We'll look at a couple of verses and we'll quit. Romans 1, verse 18. You want to understand what's behind the thinking of lost people, particularly intellectual, uh, atheists, agnostics, all that? Here it is, Romans 1, 18. Paul talks about the righteousness of God in the gospel of, of Christ. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Those are two sides of the flesh, the religious flesh and then the carnal flesh, ungodliness, unrighteousness of men. And what it says, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. They got the truth, but they hold it in unrighteousness. They want to pretend like that's not true so they can do what they want to do in their flesh. Watch this, though. Because that which may be known of God is manifest where? In them. For God has showed it unto them. You know God was so wise to put a conscience in man. And that conscience, that conscience, conscious, did I say that word right? Conscience, my ebonics. When God created Adam, he put in Adam a capacity to desire to worship a spirit being, which is God. Now you end up worshiping Satan if you're not worshiping God through Christ today. You can't get away from it. Because if you're not worshiping the living God, you're going to worship the creature, Satan, and his world system. And we're going to see as we wind down what it ends up getting to. You're just going to avoid the God of creation because you don't want to be accountable to him. See, that's the problem, man. Because if, 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 if I have to acknowledge him, I acknowledge that he's my, he's my creator, but he tells me what to do. He's my master, and I have to obey him. See, that's what you want to get out of. So if you pretend like he don't exist, then you can do your own thing, live however you want. 
But unfortunately, the Bible through Paul tells you there's a day coming when you're going to be judged by God called the great white throne. So you can't get out of it. Verse, verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them for who has showed it unto them? God has. Well, how did God show? Well, look at here. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are what type? How, how is it seen? Clearly. Clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made. When you look at this creation, you know it was some intelligence behind this. You can't just throw a bunch of things together and build a 747 just by throwing the pieces together. Man knows that, but you can't put the what? I wish I had a scientific mind to understand this, but how, 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 the, how the universe is put together, even the smallest things, how everything works together. and Even, even after 6,000 years of sin and creation, it all works together, all beautifully and put together. You know it's some genius behind that. They know it. Watch what he says. Even his eternal power and Godhead, who, his nature and his character is known through the beautiful creation out there. So that they are what? Without excuse. Oh, oh man. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. Thanksgiving is coming up. And I ask myself every year, my wife will tell you, who do atheists thank? Like when you go to Thanksgiving dinner as an atheist, who are you thanking? <laughs> Seriously. Okay. I bet they don't even pray. They can't pray then. You can't pray. I don't know. I just, it gets me more crazy. Neither were they thankful. There you go. But became, what's that next word? Vain. That means empty and useless in their thinking, in their imaginations. And their foolish heart was darkened. A fool says in his heart, there is no God. Proverbs 14.1. Now watch this. I love this. Verse 22. What's that first word of verse 22? <laughs> Professing themselves to be wise. You ever wonder where the term professor comes from? You got a college professor, this smart guy. He's up there. Oh, yeah. Interim. There it is. They professed themselves to be wise. They became fools. We'll see it in the book of 1 Corinthians. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. I always think about over in India, everything's a god. A cow's a god. Rats are a god. Me and Chris saw this thing where this guy's in a temple and it's filled with rats. You can't kill rats. You can't kill monkeys. It's nuts. Monkeys attack people. You just walk down the street, a monkey could attack you and you can't kill it. Are you crazy? I'd be in jail in India because I kill that monkey. You know why? Because they put monkeys as deities. Creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served who? The creature, that's the living creation, more than the creator, which is blessed forever, amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections for even their women. This is amazing. For even their women did change the natural use, that means the natural use of their body as the man's help and the man's complement into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. That's homosexuality. You can say, let the world can say what they want. God says, he'll tell you right here, working that which is, verse 27, which is unseemly, shameful, indecent, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. You know, the whole thing with AIDS and all that stuff. God just says that's just the natural consequence of that lifestyle. These things that happen. Verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. That means unfit for use to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness. And he goes through it, the fornication, wickedness. Verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God. Do you understand? They understand that one day they're going to. You know how I know? Because they'll look at a, a child molester and say, he's going to hell for raping that young girl and killing her. In, the, in, in their hearts, they understand it's only right for him to die and go to hell because he molested a child. They'll, they'll judge others, and they know there's a judgment. Why would they say he's going to hell? You have to understand God created hell for the, for the evil. Well then, who knowing the judgment of God, verse 32, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. They will judge a per another person quick, then, you know. Not only do the same, and the same as all these sins in the context of verse chapter 1, but watch this. 
When it comes to somebody doing the sin that you commit, you'll have pleasure in them that do it. So you will have that homosexual lifestyle, and you will find others and say, well, let's just have a pride parade about it. And you would force the community to put up your rainbow, which is really God's rainbow, have a parade where they use taxpayer money for you to flaunt yourself before God using his bow, because his bow means I'm not going to judge you for it today. Isn't that interesting? Let's end in chapter 3 of 2 Thessalonians. So can you reason with, God, with, with the word of God? Yes, you can. Can you put God on trial? Yeah, he said, come and let us reason. But Paul has a warning for, for you. You're going to run into some people who won't reason with you. When you do, understand it's a heart condition. It's not because there's not enough evidence. Because when I dealt with atheists, I realized people who say there's mistakes in the Bible, when you ask them, what, show me the mistake, they never will. People who say there's not enough evidence have never sat down and read the Gospels about our Lord Jesus Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to give a complete uh, uh, look at it and then say they don't believe. They choose to be willfully ignorant. They choose to believe the bad stuff about God's word, but they never sat down and studied out for themselves because all those atheists who do that, they end up becoming believers on the Lord Jesus Christ, most of them. Isn't that interesting? Because they see the reasonable of the word of God. But you can, you can find this man too right here. Verse, chapter 3 of 2 Thessalonians, verse 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. That's my prayer for you and I, that we let the word of God have free course in our lives and through us and be glorified. But look at verse 2. And that we may be delivered from what type of men? Unreasonable and wicked men. That's what they really are. Because you can give them all the evidence in the world and they just won't believe God's word because they're wicked in their hearts and they want to do it their way. They don't want God telling them what to do. Unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not what? Faith. Oh, yeah. See, the issue is a hard attitude of faith. Josh and I went on that radio program live three hours. Atheists listened to Brother Lee's show. Right on the air, we said, atheists, call us to, right now today. Call me. Here's my number. Here's my, call me. We know you're listening. Let's reason together. They'll do it with the other believers who don't rightly divide. They don't have any spiritual power. When Josh and I were on there, not one atheist called, and they, not one atheist called after the program. You know why? They're afraid to call because Josh and I and any of us, with our help, if you need help, can sit down and reason with them if they're reasonable that this is really God's word and they just don't want it. Don't you be that way. If you're listening today, you're atheist, agnostic, you don't know for sure that you have eternal life as a present possession, but you, you're just religious. You're just religious. Understand that God loves you, Christ died for you, and by simple faith in that fact, in that fact alone, you can have eternal life as a present possession, all your sins forgiven, and an eternal inheritance in heavenly places, all by faith. Let us pray. <clears throat> Our gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the reasonableness of your word. Father, it's not because you haven't given enough evidence or proof of your existence. The fact of the Bible and, yea, that the, they're Jews and, yea, the change in our hearts, Father. We know, we believe, but as we share your word with others, may we be bold to use the sword of the Spirit as, the, as Paul, Paul did, and may we take that book and show them that they're dead in sins. May we make their hearts tremble through that invisible sword of the Spirit, your word. May we by faith trust your word and not human wisdom and human viewpoint and human reasoning. But let us reason together with you to the lost. We want them to believe, Father. We want them to use their minds. We want them to trust you. But, Father, we understand we're going we're gonna to run into some people who just won't because they're unreasonable. May you protect us from them, but may you give us a, heart of a heart's passion for those who are willing to sit down and reason from your word. Show them that you are the God, the living God, who created all things and given us your word in the, in the Holy Scriptures. We thank you for this uh, ability to be a part of what you're doing. We thank you for your word rightly divided, the reasonable way to understand God's word without, um, you know, resting the Scriptures. 
We thank you for all this as we take our break. In Christ's name, amen.